Hi, I'm Brian Mandel, and this episode of Rheumatology Highlights Report is going to focus on gout with a particular emphasis on uh, the European League Against Rheumatism International Rheumatology Conference of 2011. There are some relevant disclosures which I indicate in this slide and will be uh, available for you to view uh, in detail as well. Gout, although it's an incredibly uh, ancient disease and many rheumatologists and even internists are quite comfortable with it, has really had a resurgence of, of knowledge and educational programs focusing on the details of, uh, of the disease, the pathogenesis, and the management. So I thought it would be a value to, right at the outset, indicate some of the, the really hot concepts and research trends uh, in gout, not all of which are represented at the ULAR meeting or in this uh, particular conference, but as you look through the rheumatology literature, uh, you're going to see a lot of these represented. So the diagnosis of gout uh, remains uh, to be uh, synovial fluid-based by finding urate crystals, but increasingly uh, ultrasound has been a tool that has been studied, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The epidemiology of gout and hyperuricemia uh, clearly, there's an increased prevalence. Not all of the explanations are uh, readily available to us, but several very large uh, evaluations of um, cross-cultural, cross-gender, cross-population databases indicate that higher meat intake, higher shellfish intake, low dairy intake, surprisingly, beer, even non-alcoholic beer, and mineral spirits all contribute across populations the higher levels of serum urate as well as the uh, actual gout uh, arthritis. The molecular basis of the gout attack is increasingly uh, better understood, and we'll talk a little bit about that with some very exciting uh, advances. The molecular mechanisms of renal uric uh, acid reabsorption. Uh, this is becoming uh, very complicated and very hot topic within uh, nephrology as well as rheumatology. What we understand now is that there, although there were many transporters, the URAT-1 transporter is really playing a prime role in the reabsorption of uric acid and from last year's um, international meetings has been a prime target for the development of newer drugs which are not yet available, which will act as very potent uric acerx, far more potent than anything that we have available now. The biological effects of urate, it turns out that uh, urate is not as uh, benign as once was thought. It's not as inert as once was thought. Uh, urate, in fact, may be the active adjuvant in Freund's adjuvant that allows antigens to be more effective in uh, acting as immunizing agents. It turns out that hyperuricemia itself can be a cause of hypertension and may contribute to cardiovascular morbidity and particularly the progression of chronic kidney disease whether treatment of hyperuricemia will influence these remains uh, to be documented. And that leads to the question of whether we should be treating hyperuricemia even without uh, gouty arthritis for those reasons. And as yet, we don't have the, the answers for that. And then there's a lot of studies which have gone into now trying to understand the more effective ways to utilize xanthine oxidase inhibitors such as allopurinol, and there's a new kid on the block, the pegylated uricase, for truly refractory gout, and we'll talk about that because that really is a game changer in our treatment of patients with very severe gouty arthritis. So if we think about ultrasound uh, as a tool, and it turns out that the historic concept uh, that we've all believed in but had very little data to support, that hyperuricemia for years would go silent but would go with deposition of urate uh, around the joint structures, and that is what contributes to the development of gouty arthritis. Uh, this has been studied with an ultrasound study that looked at 45 patients who had totally asymptomatic uh, urate, uh, about an average of uh, 8.17 milligrams. They were all ultrasounded. And surprisingly, there was a very high proportion of anatomic areas where it could be demonstrated that, in fact, urate was being deposited in the areas of tendons and joints, despite the fact that patients were totally asymptomatic. So urate deposition clearly precedes clinical gout, and that begs the question of can ultrasound imaging actually be used to predict who with hyperuricemia will develop gout and who will not? And we don't have the answer to that, and that clearly is a prime area for study.
More recently, at the uh, 2011 ULAR meeting, patients who had documented gout were studied with ultrasound. And we can see here that a significant majority of folks had ultrasound findings of uh, urate deposition around joints, suggesting that, in fact, yes, ultrasound can be useful in making the diagnosis even without synovial fluid. But if you look at the, the left side axis there, we see that probably still there's a significant proportion of folks who are not going to be documented to have urate deposition, and thus the gold standard remains uh, synovial fluid crystal analysis for the documentation and diagnosis of gout, which leads to a, a very interesting study that said, well, if this is a diagnostic study, what is the specificity of finding um, gout crystals or even pseudo-gout calcium pyrophosphate crystals? And it turns out that probably the specificity is high, but we need to recognize that you can have crystals in joint fluid even when there are alternative explanations for why the patient has acute arthritis. And I particularly draw your attention to the septic arthritis group where 10% of folks who had documented culture positive septic arthritis also had crystals. So we need to be clinicians when we evaluate the synovial fluid and not just say, well, there's a, a crystal there, so it must be only crystal disease. We need to be wary that you could have two different diseases with coexistent crystals. The epidemiology, I've picked out one abstract here, which gives us some interesting data on the prevalence up to 2008 in the NHANES uh, group. And you can see here that this kind of confirms what our impression has been over the years, that gout is predominantly uh, a male disease, but it certainly does happen in women. And in this group, uh, the prevalence in men and women were actually fairly similar. And as we get older, the prevalence of gout clearly rises. As we get older, if we're of the female persuasion, as we lose estrogen, uh, more estrogen is reabsorbed, predominantly through that URAD1 receptor in the kidney, and women postmenopausally catch up uh, to men. But again, epidemiologically, the mean urate over time as we age increases, as does in parallel the prevalence of disease with a 30% prevalence in patients 70 to 79 years in this study. So it remains a very common disease. Switching gears from the epidemiology to the molecular basis, this is an incredibly fascinating topic for years to many of us as to what actually causes the acute uh, gout attack. And the paradigm for many years was that crystals are phagocytized by neutrophils, by mononuclear cells, by synovial lining cells. It's been documented that crystals trigger a number of intracellular biochemical mechanisms, several kinases, some of which seem to be crystal-specific or activated. That goes on to lead to specific gene activation, and a number of chemoattractants and cytokines uh, are released from the cells depending on the cell uh, of origin. More recently, and this I'll go into more detail here because uh, it's absolutely a fascinating observation and leads directly to uh, clinical uh, decision making, is that an intracellular body, macromolecular complex, if you will, it's not a membrane bound uh, individual body like a mitochondria or lysosome, it's a complex of proteins called the inflammasome, leads to the direct activation of pro-IL-1 and the release of interleukin-1-beta uh, into the extracellular space. And it turns out that this may, in fact, be the major uh, mediator of the acute gouty attack, which will take us directly from bench to bedside and let us target a biologically relevant cytokine, interleukin-1. So in summary of this, and we'll come back and look at this in a little more detail in the next slides, but monosodium urate crystals trigger acute inflammation, at least for a major part, the activation of this NALP3 inflammasome. The NALP3 refers to a specific type of inflammasome with the recognition component of the inflammasome being the NALP3 uh, protein. And this leads to generation of interleukin-1. There have been anecdotal reports and clinical experience suggesting that IL-1 blockade can successfully treat acute gout attacks, and that's really been uh, for a while that we've known that. And although, you know, expensive, biologics 
really can be effective, and this has been demonstrated with several different uh, IL-1 uh, blockers, and we'll come back and talk about that uh, as well at the clinical level in a second. So let's look at the cell for a minute and talk about what urate crystals do uh, to cells. They'll get them to generate interleukin-1 and how they do it, and this is a fascinating story. So the study was demonstrating how crystals will activate IL-1. If we look at the background of this in the cell, we can see that um, the macromolecular complex of the inflammasome, the point of this complex is to activate pro-IL-1, which is triggered by a number of different factors, including anything that activates the toll cell receptor, toll like receptors on the surface of the cell will make pro-IL-1, which is not active and stays inside the cell. But the inflammasome will activate these and then lead to the release into the environment of the cell into leukin-1 beta, and that acts to, to stimulate inflammation. So how do crystals go about doing this? Well, it turns out when crystals are phagocytized by mononuclear cells or other cells, they are in the go into the cell, invaginated into the cell with a membrane-bound vacuole, and then acidic lysosomes will fuse with this endocytic vacuole containing the crystals. They release the acid content and pump more protons into that vacuole. The hydrogen ions will displace the sodium from the crystals. The sodium goes into the cytoplasm. The cell reacting to this increased intracellular calcium will swell, Water will come in, causing the swelling and reducing the sodium content. And what happens with that is that once the water comes in, it dilutes out the potassium, dropping the intracellular potassium concentration, and that actively stimulates the inflammasome caspase activity to generate IL-1. So how is this actually demonstrated? Well, each of these steps could be inhibited specifically, and this was what was done in this study that was summarized uh, in the journal of Biological Chemistry. A drug like hydroxychloroquine, which blocks the acidic environment of the lysosome, was given to animals. It blocked the hydrogenation of these vacuoles, preventing hydrogen from coming in, displacing the sodium, and this blocked the activation of interleukin-1. If you instead you of using sodium urate crystals, you use potassium urate crystals, that too prevented the activation of interleukin-1. If water coming into the cell was blocked by aquaporin uh, receptor antagonists, water couldn't come in, the potassium level didn't drop, interleukin-1 was not generated. So it's a fascinating story by which crystals come in, cause displacement of sodium, that goes into the cytoplasm, water comes in, dilutes potassium, and that's what activates interleukin-1 uh, generation. So why do we care about this? What does this translate to? Well, what it translates to is that we have a mechanism and demonstration that IL-1 is released, and we should be able to block that clinically, and if we do, suppress gouty arthritis. So here's a study from the ACR in 2011 that reported 22 hospitalized patients who were treated with anakinra, IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, for their gout. They were given 100 milligrams sub-Q daily for three days. Uh, 19 of the 22 patients had dramatically decreased pain in even less than one day, and 9 of 22 had complete resolution in less than five days. What was the reason this drug was needed is that they either failed prophylactic colchicine and steroid or comorbidities were such that they didn't want to use steroids or non-steroidal drugs. And here are the data showing, again, very dramatic effect of the anakinra at causing improvement of pain very rapidly, but actually complete resolution of the pain of the gouty attack in 10 days or less in almost every patient. So clearly, this is uh, an effective therapy. Is it only anakinra? No. Here's a summary of three different uh, studies presented at ULAR with three different agents, catechinumab, relonicept, or anakinra, all of which block IL-1 in slightly different ways, and all of which were very effective at blocking 
uh, or remediating the acute uh, gouty attack. So anti-leukin-1 directed therapy is clearly effective at treating acute gouty arthritis. Let's move on to some of the clinical effects of hyperuricemia. Uh, there was a whole lot of this at the ACR uh, in 2011 at ULAR. There was a little bit less, but here's one study that looked at the comparison of 48 control VA patients versus uh, some with asymptomatic hyperuricemia or those with hyperuricemia and gout. And what they demonstrated by detailed chart review is that compared to uh, control patients, those with asymptomatic hyperuricemia had a higher um, prevalence of coronary artery disease, which was increased even further if patients had gouty arthritis. So we're really building a story here that hyperuricemia is directly related to the prevalence of coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease in the general population. And what we need to sort out is whether treating hyperuricemia will lead to a resolution or regression of coronary disease. So finally, I'd like to talk about the treatment of hyperuricemia in gout and several uh, controversies which have been addressed in some manner or form uh, at ULAR in 2011. The first relates to the treatment of hyperuricemia in gout in patients, uh, particularly those who have uh, renal insufficiency. There are guidelines been issued around the LOR, and that's L-O-R-E, not L-A-W, uh, that we need to dose adjust um, the dosing of allopurinol to try to limit uh, hypersensitivity reactions. And then there's been controversy, should you just limit the initiating dose of allopurinol or whether your final dose of allopurinol needs to be reduced uh, in this setting. So here's a retrospective case control study with gout um, and looked at patients who had allopurinol hypersensitivity reaction versus matched controls. And they got for the most part, three match controls for every uh, patient who had a hypersensitivity reaction. They matched for gender, GFR, diuretic use, and age. And what they looked at was the question of, was the dose of allopurinol that was started, was that related to the likelihood of developing a hypersensitivity reaction? And what they found was, yes, indeed, if you started with a dose of allopurinol above the guidelines for dose adjustment in chronic uh, kidney disease, you had a much higher chance of developing a hypersensitivity reaction. But this does not get at the question of what happens if you, you start low but don't have a hypersensitivity reaction. Can you go up on the dose of allopurinol to be able to effectively lower the urate? And that you need to look far broader in the literature. And in fact, there are no data and I say inconclusive here, but there really are no data that the final allopurinol dose needs to be adjusted based on the estimated GFR. But from this abstract, it certainly suggests that we should start uh, at a very low dose of allopurinol, particularly in chronic kidney disease, and then slowly increase the dose up in order to be able to gain uh, efficacy. So finally, the new kid on the block, which I think is the most exciting um, uh, intervention that we have for treatment of truly refractory severe tophaceous gouty arthritis, and that's puricase or uricase that is pegylated uh, in, with the idea that pegylation will lead the enzyme to persist longer in the, in the circulation and be less uh, immunogenic. So pegylated uricase uh, in several clinical trials has been used. It needs to be given intravenously. Uh, the proposed um, labeling will be 8 milligrams, which is the vial that it comes in, should be diluted and be given every two weeks. It has a dramatic effect on the urate level in the blood by 24 hours, uh, dropping often to far less than 1 milligram per deciliter. With continued therapy, the TOFI have clearly been demonstrated in clinical trials to resolve, although that does take uh, several months. This is not inexpensive therapy. The surprising um, uh, event that happened was a number of patients, greater than 90% in fact, did develop antibodies to the drug, and most of it was to the pegylation. Infusion reactions were fairly common in at least a quarter of the patients, and it turns out that those infusion reactions, particularly when they were severe, were associated with the development of antibodies uh, to the drug. The good part of that is, in fact, 
those who develop antibodies to the drug have a less robust uh, response to the drug with subsequent dosing. So we can follow that. So the patient who uh, at two weeks no longer is dropping their serum urate level down as anticipated after getting the peglodicase, those are patients who have antibodies that are more likely related to the, more likely to develop hypersensitivity reactions, and we need to stop the therapy because they're not likely to gain benefit and are more likely to develop um, uh, allergic reactions. So the practical points is that the, the vial is suspended. Uh, pretreatment should be given before every dose with hydrocortisone, uh, acetaminophen, and antihistamine, and they should be given the dose uh, every two weeks. They need to be on some form of prophylaxis against gouty attacks because this dramatic drop will certainly elicit uh, gouty arthritis in the majority uh, of patients uh, who get this drug. The serum urate level should be checked for before each uh, subsequent dose, and if it's not dropping down, and here the, su the suggested target is it's not dropping down below six, that suggests that the patient is making antibodies against the drug and therapy should really be uh, discontinued. And here's a little bit of the summary information uh, from the trial that was presented. Uh, it was a six-month study. You see the infusion reactions are fairly common, even with premedication. Uh, mobilization flares of gout, incredibly uh, common, and 45% of patients had resolution of at least one TOFUS um, if they were able to continue therapy. So incredibly uh, effective therapy. How best to administer it? Uh, I think in the current uh, environment of those who are on uh, baseline hypouricemic therapy with allopurinol or um, uh, Fibuzostat or Probenicid or some combination of Probenicid and one of the others should continue that drug therapy. As long as they're tolerating it, we should introduce peglodicase on top of that, and then hopefully we'll be able to debulk or get rid of the overwhelming urate load in the patients, and then perhaps oral therapy alone will be able to maintain uh, the patient with a level of urate below six. We don't know that that's going to happen, and that's, those are studies that need to be done, but I think in my own practice, that's the way I'm going to start uh, to use the drug. Chronic therapy, there are issues with cost and convenience. We do need to be aware about the development of antibodies, as I said. And the only thing that I really take away uh, as a very positive from this is that those patients who are able to maintain themselves on the drug, it was shown at ULAR in an abstract that patients who are able to maintain chronic use the likelihood of infusion reactions over time was incredibly low with dramatic uh, response of 78% of the TOFI resolved uh, by 50 weeks. So this is really very dramatic therapy, but we do need to remember to prophylax uh, against attacks. So in summary, gout is a very old disease that we're still learning how to best manage, but we have a lot of new tools uh, on the horizon and available uh, in our toolkit. So I thank you for, um, for sharing this time and discussing gout with me.